I hit the record. Fed phone is rolling. What's up with my guy? We're here with Willie Shaw. I thought this would be cool because Willie, you've been on a journey. You've you've left the Bay Area and gone around. What's this past after people saw you fighting on TV? Where have you been going? Uh man, I went to Atlanta. Got to see how Atlanta was, get some of that hardcore training. Went to the dog house, aka the grind house, man. Shout out to Mustafa and them and them boys up there, man. It was some work. I went out there for a month and a half. And then uh end up coming to PA Ambridge, Pennsylvania. And that's where I'm at now until I get a fight. Then I can come back home when I'm not in fight camp, I guess. So I was just thinking about you, Willie, because I don't think people understand like how little amateur experience you had and how you kind of picked up the sport. You, you went pro and now like a young fighter might look at you and be like, Oh man, that guy's got two losses and you're learning a ton on the job now. And then what's even crazier is two years ago, you were the prospect two years ago. You were the guy. Oh, who is this guy? So like, it, it's crazy how this fight game is. Yeah, man, the fight game it, it's hard, but, I mean, it it depends on what you do after you lose or when you run into that wall. You want to keep going or is you trying to slow down? And, I mean, after that fight, I know for a fact, I'm like, man, these people got all this experience and stuff over me. I ain't saying they bad or anything, but I'm on the same level as y'all, and I, and I ain't even close to hitting my ceiling yet. Like, like you said, I'm learning on a job, and – I kind of came in there and kind of shook things up just a little bit. And then I took a little step back, like a fall back down because of the losses, but the losses don't really define you. If you can know what your weakness is and what you got to work on, you got to dedicate your life to try and work on that. And that's what I'm doing. I'm sacrificing. I want to be a champ and I know I'm going to be a champ. So that's what I'm doing now. I'm, I'm chasing it still. Well, let me defend my man, Willie Shaw. Your your losses aren't really those bad of losses. Marufo just beat a guy uh, on another club show, and that was, a, that was a close, close fight. That's like one of those fights, dead even fight. I think you probably won it if all things are fair, but I'm not a judge. And yeah. then Josue Vargas, uh, you caught him in the first round, and then my man, Chon Zapata, it looked like he followed the Willie Shaw game plan. It looked like he saw something you saw. <laughs> Man, I man, I'm t- look, I swear, man. Like, I was when I watched that fight with him and Sapita, I was like, man, that's supposed to be me right there fighting that dude because I was supposed to do the same thing. And it's like, I know how close I was to that. That was life changing for me if I would have did that. But I know how close it was, and it just me seeing that, I was like, man. There's no fucking way that shouldn't have been you. Like, he did exactly the same thing, had him the same fucking way, everything exactly how I had it. And me, it just, I didn't capitalize. Ain't nothing I can say about it. I mean, I left it all out there, but I didn't capitalize, which I, I should have did, and he capitalized off of it. But to keep it real, I think that when you say capitalize, I think that's experience. I think going to Mustafa being out in PA, going to all these different places, you're now getting that experience you didn't get in the amateurs. You're learning from all different looks and people. And I think that that's what's going to make you a dangerous fighter in the coming years. Ooh, I'll tell you, Luke, you, you be on point with everything you be saying. It's like you just be having mind reading tricks. Man, even if I'm working in the shadows, Lukey knows what's going on. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you are right. I said, I just don't like to give no excuse. Yeah, experience played a part, but I mean, I just felt like I still should have did what I did. But after after that fight, I learned a whole lot, even just from watching it and talking to people. And then like I even conversated with war multiple times and trying to get advice. Tim Bradley talk talked to me after, even when we was at the airport, and it was like, they seen the talent. They was just like, man, you, it's just you got some stuff you just got to work on. And right then and there, I was like, man, like I, I got it. I got to fix this. And then sure enough, now that I'm getting more of this experience and all the stuff that I've been doing for these past months, it's crazy because the stuff I see now, I'm like, yo, I should have been, 
uh, that man, that fight would have been that much easier for what I know now. No, no disrespect to Josue. You know what I mean? I'm not not trying to disrespect nobody, but like, I I believe and I know my skill. And it's like, yo, if I catch anybody now, it's like it they they seen the old me and thought I was dangerous. Then me now was like, I'm a whole different breed of dude now. It, it's crazy. Well, I think that one the reason I know you're a different breed of dude is you made a decision to to move for boxing. This is an adult decision. People move for their job and you actually were like, okay, I'm not just going to stay in the Bay area. I'm going to change things up. I'm going to shake, I'm going to shake ish up. What was that decision like to separate from your loved ones for this dream? Ooh, it's hard. I mean, real hard. Like even, even right now, like I'm away, no disrespect to my family. Like I love my family. But then, you know, it's me and my girl, and that's who's been with me through thick and thin. It's like, like, I ain't said I left her, but I've been away for so long chasing the dream. I know the sacrifice is going to be worth it, but it's hard. I mean, I hate it so much that I love it, if that really makes sense. Like, I'd be so pissed off and mad, but then I remember at the same time, like, a lot of the greats had to do this. If you want to be great, you got to sacrifice something. You got to be willing to change up something. And if I want to be a winner, why would I stay at home? I can't, if I'm not doing good or I'm not achieving what I need to achieve at home right now ain't for me. Only thing is come out, get the experience, get under somebody wing that know what they're doing and then let them just show you the ropes. Don't talk, just listen, be all ears. So what's, what's your current gym situation right now? I'm training with Tommy and Kello, if you know who that is. Old Roy, he, jo- Roy Jones uh, back in the day, right? Yes, sir. That's who I'm with right now. And I, I, I end up clicking up with him. He followed me for years on the gram. And you already know I'm not really a social media guy like that. And um, I end up hitting him up. Ro ended up hitting him up and, you know, was like, go out there, see how it is. And what I needed was a lot of fundamentals. I need to really get that down because like you said, I didn't have too much amateur background. So I need to get everything I can. I ain't saying a short amount of time. It could have been short, but it really ain't been short, but we've been squeezing, working hard, cramming much as we can. And I knew that she was the guy like Mustafa, Mustafa know what he's doing. He know what he's doing. You know, it's just Mustafa got a lot of fighters and stuff right now, but Tommy and Kello, man, I mean, I'm grateful for meeting that dude. I mean, that dude's like a freaking boxing guru somehow. I don't know. It's just, it, it's a blessing. So, Well, I also think it comes down to situations, personalities, and timing, right? So, like, the greatest box, enter whatever you want the greatest boxing coach to be. If the greatest boxing coach has eight hours of his day set aside and you're hour nine, whether it's the first hour or the last hour of the day, he might not be the greatest boxing coach for you. I think a lot of times it's situational and the motivation the coach wants to put in. And it sounds like you're in a situation where you're building a team away from your team that's going to build towards this goal. Who you been talking to, Luke? <laughs> you been talking to somebody, man. I'm telling you, 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 I'm telling you, you just you like a freaking mind reader or something, but that's definitely like what it is it's like i got so much time in the world with tom i mean we come in the gym and it's crazy like i I thought i knew boxing but this guy we watching film two hours three hours Uh, he's he's talking rewind talk rewind you see that rewind then we going over other stuff then we drilling so much i mean i ain't never drilled so much in my life and we're drilling. So it's like a practice. It's like football. It's like you do film room and then you really bring it in. It's like a, like really like study. And, exact, and, and that's exactly what I'm doing. Like I'm, I'm, I'm doing a lot that I've never, I've never had a chance to do before. And I'm, I'm trying to hone everything it is. And he tell me all the time, he's like, you know, we don't coach no losers. I, I work on nothing, but just, I won't, I'll make you be great. I see a lot of talent. I don't just work with anybody. And 
I mean, I, I believe he don't work with just anybody that he really took me on because he saw talent and I ain't finna let him down. I mean, I'm here now. I wouldn't be here. I'm actually staying in his place now. One of his place, like one of his his camp homes. So well, I got I gotta lose it for a second because I lost it on Twitter today, man. Because these fighters annoy me right now. Because guys aren't taking fights, and then the fans are telling me it's about money and all this stuff. When are people? When are the fighters gonna just be trying to say I'm the toughest guy? Like back in the day, I like Marvin Hagler. Of course, he's gonna make a lot of money. He's Marvin Hagler, but you gotta win a couple of fights, and you gotta make people scared of you at a certain point. And I'm so sick of just hearing things about business and all this. And I look at guys like Tevin Farmer. I look at guys like yourself. They got a couple of losses. The fans can't abandon fighters because they lose. Because guess what? You actually took fights. This should be applauded. It should be <laughs> applauded for taking fights. People people nowadays, they want 30 fights. And if they're 30 and 0, they want a cookie. I See, you know what? I, for the people that that's undefeated, I'm not saying it's easy. But, you know, we always know, like you said, the business side of help them get there. But, I, I mean, if you look at, the greats besides Floyd name one other great that's that's undefeated well they I mean I'll, I'll hit you with Rocky and Joe Calzaghi because those are my stocks oh yeah basically yeah, basically, uh, <laughs> basically like what I'm saying is everyone wants to be Floyd but the problem is no one wants to train like Floyd no one wants to work like Floyd but they want the money Floyd has and they want everyone to like his fights like Floyd but there's a whole like, I don't think Floyd can jump on a podcast with us and talk on a gang of issues. His life is literally boxing. And, like, yeah, that's see, what you need. Man, no lie. that you That's real talk. I, I don't say a lot of other fighters don't be working hard or whatever. Like, yeah, they work hard because they doing what they got to do. But the reason I always looked up to Floyd as a fighter is, like, what you said. It's the hard work that he put in, like, yeah, he got to 50 and knowing everything, but the dude just lived, eat, shit, sleep, boxing. That's all he did. He ran and whenever the hell he felt like running, he was always in fight shape. He studied the game hard. And, like, you know, they, they give out money in boxing to a lot of just uh, social media well, fighters. No, I'll, I'll say it right now because I, I deal with this right now. Every year or two, every promoter wants the next fighter they think will make a million dollars. And there's always someone that's winning a national tournament, or there's always someone that beats someone up in sparring. And if they align themselves with the right person, they can be there. But the truth chamber is when the lights are on and it's not an exhibition in the gym, because I've seen you beat up guys and guys have gotten on you and all that. It don't matter until it's fight night. None of that matters until you get in the ring and the problem is there's lots of really good fighters that when they get in there, they just don't have it. That yeah, that's true. That and see me being around doing my experience, I feel like maybe they ain't working in a gym. I mean, it's like you said, just people that just ain't ready for that, but maybe they don't train in the gym like like how they want to fight. They probably in the gym, you know, half assed and beating on novice people make it you know just it, a lot of yes men around so well the the red flag to me is watching shadow boxing so i always try to watch people shadow box whether it's their videos they put out because if they're just beating up the shadow if they're just beating them up knocking them down it's all offensive what's going to happen if they need to hit a defensive move and every single time <laughs> they shadow box they're just they're getting 10 six rounds and now all of a sudden they're like, if a guy can't shadow box and put their back on the ropes and situationally be aware of what do I do if I'm on the ropes, like, you you need to think through this as a fighter. Yeah, that is true. I, it, man, last, it's so hard to explain. The, it's, like, I don't even know where to start out with that because it's just – because you do got the fighters, and there's people we cool with that we know do that, that's succeeding – and it's like, you know, we ain't trying to throw no shade or hate on them. It just, damn, man, like, you will run across somebody that that's going to have to hit you back. And then will you know what to do when that happens? Have you practiced on that? Or, like, or, or are you really that guy? Like, some people get a loss or they, not even just a loss, they get, 
they get hit in a real fight with a real opponent. And they those small go, gloves are no joke, bro. Yeah. Like you get hit with that, you think you're gonna catch a punch, and it goes through your glove, and now all of a sudden you're in Buzz City. You're getting a DUI <laughs> checkpoint by the referee. He's saying walk left, walk right. Look, you're getting all these things administered to you. You never want a referee saying when they say stuff like basically kind and friendly, you're in trouble. They they hey people panic, man. It's pressure bus pipes and some people can't take that especially when like i said when people been at the high part of their career all the time nothing but yes man and then last like, somebody come in with no respect and crack them and they like oh shit they change they hope their career kind of change after that they they ain't the same fight they don't keep coming back the same they come back for the check you know i'm gonna just get paid now that that's what they do well, I think and the, another thing that I think is like I want boxing and I, I know this sounds kind of cynical, but boxing is terrible right now. Like there, there's not a lot of good fights. There's a couple here and there, but we're getting to this point where like I'm watching boxing, but I really am watching basketball and football over boxing because at least it's competitive. You know, like it's like, what am I really watching for when these fights aren't that good? So it's like at a certain point, I want guys to just test themselves and the fans to be like, okay, you lost. That's fine. Because this is a really unhealthy way of looking at this sport where guys have to be undefeated for 20 fights for us to call them good. You know what's crazy? As you saying that, a lot of people are gravitating towards UFC because they they forcing people to fight each other. And it's like boxing. You, I mean, when I guess when people say you become a champion or whatever you want to call it, uh, a second belt holder, whatever it is, they get to pick and choose. I mean, I that's how the game go. I do I like it? Hell no. Like I said, if I feel like if you in the game right now, and you you're going to make money regardless. In my mind, you're going to make the money regardless. So if you got any pride for yourself. You want to be a bragger. You want to be a bragging right. Fight them up, buggers that you know is tough. Because at the end, y'all gonna end up shit talking some way somehow. But the words don't mean shit. At the end of the day, these right here is what's gonna do all the talk. Well, and don't guys come from the streets? Boxing's like the streets. Don't you want to find out who the tough guy is? Don't you want to test who's out there? Don't you want to see who the real? The real challenges are you don't get you don't get credit in the streets picking on guys that are below you. That's not that's not you don't get cool points for that. Nah, nah. See, yeah, that's nah. But see, everybody ain't bred like us. You see what I mean? Like we a different breed. We we come from that where it's like, all right, you gotta prove yourself. You just can't just go beat on a bum and then be like, oh yeah, he's good. How we really know if he's good? Did he fight somebody good? Like you got to prove to us. And it's like, I give credit to the people that fight with their heart out, win, lose, or draw. You get my respect because you stepped in the ring, you took the loss like a fucking champion, and you're talking about coming back, fighting somebody else that's good. You, you nice in my book. You you putting your heart on the fucking line. Fuck well, I think anyone that's in the gym a lot that keeps taking pro fights and they're actually showing up in shape, making the weight and coming in with a game plan and putting money to their camp. People shouldn't just call these guys like, Oh, he's not very good. He's not that because people don't understand. Also people's life circumstances are different at different moments. Boxing does not pay all that well. So guys are going through messed up financial situations and trying to train and then all of a sudden they might actually be able to train full time because they got a little money and people are like, oh, he's not good because of this situation when they don't even know half of the financial struggle. It's a poor man's sport. All, all, all a lot of fans see is us fighting and that's all they think is we just get in the ring, run a couple of times a week and fight. That's it. They don't they, they don't see it's so much hard work and so much little stuff that become big stuff. And training can stack and change. Uh, j- j- let's just say a sparring partner. You don't got the money to hire a good sparring partner or sparring partners. You 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 probably not even be prepared for the fight, right? Because you don't have no good sparring partners. If you got money to pay for that, you well prepared all the fucking time. I mean, all the fucking time. 
Well, the golden standard is Andre Ward and Terrence Crawford. Like you look at Crawford, he's always got new people and they're trying to beat him up, you know? And it's like, I don't understand. This is what I want to understand. If you're a young fighter, look at Canelo, look at Tyson Fury, look at Terrence Crawford. These are the best guys. And it's like, what are they doing besides training? Oh, they have this. They're, they got to cook. They got it. So if I get money, I'm going to hire a chef. So like, I don't have to think about that. Like that should be the recipe. And it's like, you said little things lead to big things. I've always said Terrence Crawford beats Errol Spence because all the little decisions Terrence makes outside of the ring, not drinking and driving, all that stuff. In a fight, it's those tiny things that add up that get you a win. Man, that, that's facts right there. That's a hundred percent facts. That ain't nobody. But see, people don't think. But a lot of young boxers or upcoming boxers or boxers that's pro- at the top right now don't think like that. They like let's just say the past weekend. I don't know if you watched the fights on the zone. I watch everything. Well, I, I like the guy that that. that Are we talking about Ray? Yep, I I I like him as a, he's nice. He's I nice. Like, I like his story. I like Ray's story. And he fought a tough ass dude. I, I mean, a tough ass dude. I'm not gonna say who I thought was because it's my opinion. Ain't nobody gonna agree with me. They don't gotta agree with me, but it's like I don't know how his camp and everything went. To me, look well prepared. But I will say the other guy, damn, he threw everybody for a fucking loop. Like who? Who the fuck did he pay the spar? How was he preparing? Was he under a rock just working out, training? Like, things like that. It's like, oh, my God. Like, you don't know what to expect out of somebody because you got to really make sure you do Like, you, it's the little things that you're doing outside the ring that you prepare for all certain. Give every, you got to have every fucking look, no matter what happens. But here's the other thing I noticed with young fighters, and I saw this in Ray's fight. A lot of young fighters, when they're stepping up to eight and 10 rounds, and I think I even saw this in your fight with the first Marufo, punch volume. When you're young in your career, however many punches you think you're throwing is probably not the amount the judges think you're throwing. And I see a lot of times, guys, like I even saw this with Keith Thurman this weekend. Keith Thurman was doing a lot of clock management. Okay, I've thrown a lot of punches. Let me move around a little bit. Okay, I can get my flurry here. But I see with a lot of young eight to 10 round fighters, they just don't have the punch volume. And I don't know what it is, but it's like you have to learn the amount of punches you have to throw. And that guy he was fighting, that was a guy that was fully committed to throw. What did he throw? Probably five, six, maybe 700 punches in the fight. That's a high output. And no matter how sharp you are, he's going to be throwing. Yeah, uh, I mean, I'm going to give you my honest opinion from from my perspective and I had to learn it the hard way. I had to hear it the hard way. I wasn't in punch shape. I was in shape, but was I in punch shape? I never really understood what the fuck punch shape was. Cause I was going off my thought. I'm like, what? I know I'm letting my hands go, but I, I learned punch shape is, is, is very different. It doesn't matter if, if you look at a lot of Mexican fighters, they, they bodies can be all beat up, whatever. They might get tired fast, but one thing they don't have, like they don't get tired of is punching because they're punch shaped like crazy. They don't give a fuck what it is. They throw punches from all different types of angles. And it's like, because we athletic, we got a gift. We rely big on that gift. We go let our hands go and we go be like, what? I, what do you mean? Look, y'all was, I was throwing like four or five combos around. And we go back and watch it. Damn, Luke, he was right. I probably do like two combos and the rest was just single punches. Well, I we scared feel to get like, I feel like there's a certain style of pressure fighter and I'm not getting racial here, but we're going to say sometimes it can be a Mexican fighter, but there's a certain style of pressure fighter that when they fight an athletic moving fighter and that fighter doesn't crack them with something that pushes them back they get confidence in the middle of the fight. They're like, okay, I've taken that shot. Now I can go crazy. And they build up. And I think in like the fights like Ray Ford, your fight with Marufo in the second fight, when I was watching the fight, you, you made him hesitate in the middle rounds. You made him have to do things. And I think it's important with those pressure fighters. Sure, you want to box, but you also don't want them to get confidence and be like, okay, I can just keep throwing and throwing and throwing. And he's just going to try to point me, but I'm just going to throw a million punches. You're 100% right. 
being out here in uh, Pennsylvania, first thing Tommy and Kello told me, he said, you never want nobody to get their momentum going. You don't, want the tr- you don't want the truck to start coming and you think you can just stop the truck when it's already going. You got to stop the truck right then and there. So therefore, the, you he, now he starts to second guess. You got to kind of sit down. Even if you think you ain't got no power, he going to respect you enough because you're starting to, you either letting your hands go so much or you delivering enough steam for him to be like, oh, I can't just, I can't just throw anything. Like it, it's definitely different type of pressure fires that do stuff like that. And you can't, it's a momentum thing. You got to make sure the momentum stay with you. You got to pace control. If you can't slow his pace down by forcing his pace, then, then it become a his fight or it's up for grabs. And that's I'll give you a perfect example. So the guy that beat Gabe Flores, and that annoyed me so much, but um, when you watch tape on him, it's just horrible. Like, it's just like, it's weird. And it's, it's it like, it's unappealing to my eye because I was raised on those Shakur Stevenson, straight punches, straight lines, fun. Like I call it fundamentally Fundament. sound and looking sweet. Like, ooh, that looked like you see it, and it's almost like seeing a skateboard trick or a great athletic play. You're like, ooh, that was nice. Like, you react and you feel good. But sometimes there's Mexican fighters where you almost wonder if they're a pro boxer, but they're just willing to throw, and they're aggressive, and they're crazy. And I've learned you have to respect that, even though it's like, I mean, honestly, like even Rios Alvarado, I'm turning the TV off, man. I'm turning the TV off for that one because it's just, it's not my thing. They're just punching each other. I get that there's a lot of fans where they're like, that's my favorite fight. I'm not in this sport to see two guys just beat each other up. I want to see greatness. I want to see the highest level of the sport. So if, if these guys, if that style they're fighting, it can be fun for one night. But if it's not messing with Manny Pacquiao, I want to see the style that messes with Pacquiao. That's where I'm going because I want to see the highest level of this. And I get not everyone wants that. I got a question because I, I thought about this. What if they not really taking too much punishment, but they achieve greatness in just a, a very ugly way, I want to say. They not they got a little bit of fundamentals, but like you said, some people don't really – it's fan friendly like it's it looked like they might so be like orlando out. salido would that be like a good example of that like orlando salido was kind of an ugly boxer and he beat lomachenko i'm trying to think of like a guy that's that's kind of not real sweet with i mean emmanuel navarrete feels like that to me right now like that's what i was that's what i was about to say my he's like example. he's like a guy where it's like if i watch tape on him like i was like <laughs> how does ruben lose to this guy like the guy can't step with his jab falls all over the place but the thing is he must be really awkward his punches must hit a lot harder than oh, they look so- yeah and he must throw from really friggin' weird angles because i remember i was watching it with my buddies and they're like, which one's the guy you know? I go, it's Ruben. They go, oh, he's beating the brakes off of this guy because the other guy looks like he doesn't know how to fight. And like to the to the layman person, that's my, obviously they're my friend. They know that I know the guy. Yeah. Ruben looks like he's doing more to them because it looked like he was doing the boxer stuff. But Navarrete is just down. I think that's part of boxing is sometimes you get guys that are just down and fighting a dude that's just crazy and he's down. And he can punch a little bit. That's a hell of a journey. Oh man, you gotta bring your lunchbox. It's gonna be a long fucking night with people like that. And and look, he's a champ at it. Like, I don't think they want to switch anything up. They just mastered his craft of just awkwardness. So I want to see him versus Shakur because I want to see what that would look like. Because Shakur is the master of the distance and keeping range. And I want to see how Navarrete, what is Navarrete's plan for Shakur? I, you know what? I thought about that. Would he just jump in? How is it going to look? I mean, I want to say Shakur easily. But then, you know, that is a champ at the same time. So I'm pretty sure he, they go have, they go figure something out. Or he's going to land. It's boxing. He's going to land something. And will that change anything? Like, it's it's a toss-up. That that's a, I'm not saying really it's a toss-up because I still believe Shakur 100%. I, just, then, I think it's hard if you let Shakur land clean punches on you. Like, it's, I just don't think that, like, I, I, I just don't think that's a good life lesson to let Shakur, who turns his punches over, good distance controller, 
you, yeah, you, I feel like that fight might be a fight like Joette Gonzalez, where after two rounds, Navarrete is like, you know what? I'm going to start boxing with you. <laughs> hey, yeah, you right. He going to try it, but is he going to succeed? <laughs> Low key, question. those are some of my favorite Floyd fights when like the guy tries to pressure Floyd and he's like, oh, that, that actually kind of hurts. So now I'm going to box with you. <laughs> they, oh, that shit doesn't, you know, Luis Colazzo. Could we? Okay. I, I would say that, but second fight, I mean, nah, you, he didn't have no chance. No, you mean He's, Madonna. You mean Madonna. Louis Colazzo, you're probably thinking of Ricky Hatton. You mean Floyd I mean, versus Madonna. Castillo, that's what I meant to say, Castillo. Or oh, you um, Jose Luis Castillo. Jose, yeah, there we go. Yeah, Jose Luis Castillo. I didn't know how to pronounce his name, but yeah, him. I, I mean, he came the first like the first time the way he fought Floyd, that was like you could tell he came there to change his life. The second time you could tell Floyd was pissed and he <laughs> felt like people were just utterly disrespecting him. And he went there to make a point. Yeah, if you get Floyd the second time, it's over. It's, well, my, it's you can do the Madonna second time was the fun one for me because it looked like Madonna was basically out of the sport. Like, he's like, yeah, I actually made a lot of money in this fight, but I'll do it again. <laughs> like, you did not see the same guy again. It looked actually like Maidana kind of liked Floyd. Like, he's like, dude, you really changed my life. <laughs> like, I love you for this. Just <laughs> yeah. beat on me a little bit. <laughs> but I mean, like, that was just like, a, like I, I don't want to say it was like a sparring session, but you could tell that they both kind of liked each other. Like, they were like, yeah, let's just, let's do it again. You know, make some money. Oh. He just finessed the game, finessed it. I'm not saying he wasn't trying hard, but yeah, it did look like that. And it's like, it, I mean, it, but see, with my Donna, I'm not mad about that because my Donna gave us such a fight with Floyd, the first fight. I'm not mad. Like, you can, you can get a run back. And even if you're not fully committed, not saying he isn't, but I mean, I'm not mad at that. You you did something a lot of fighters will never do. He won like four rounds against Floyd. Yeah, and it may, and he made a long fucking night for Floyd. I'm pretty sure Floyd did not like that. Did but, not like it one bit. Remember when show when the show scores wouldn't show up till round nine because they thought Floyd might be up. They didn't show, they didn't show those Showtime scores for a very long time. <laughs> So they start, yeah, they was, oh, that, well, that's when they start switching the narrative up after a while. Oh, they, it was all my, they start talking all my, oh, man, my Donna, he can close the show out if he, can he keep this output up like this? Man, Floyd's having a hard time. And it's like, at first y'all wasn't, you know, I mean, I know that's their job to be more on the A side guy, but it's like, that got, a, that also got a chance about boxing too. If we want to see fans, be we can't real. have commentators that are basically just like kind of actively promoting one fighter and then indifferent about the other. Yeah, like we got to be real. Like, ooh, he kind of getting touched up. I mean, he might need to work on some more. He ain't really doing this good this round. A guy could dance a whole round. I think Andre and Tim Bradley do a good job. Oh, oh, they real. They they give it to you raw though. They, I don't think they care. I don't know if who I don't know if Bob Aaron be caring about you know them, but they do a great job. Like, oh, this ain't supposed to happen. Oh, that's why he's getting touched up. Oh, Andre's the best because Andre basically tells you what he's thinking, and you can really learn from it. Like he'll he'll say things like he could make this fight easier if he was using a jab. Like he'll say things that you know, like all think. I think that the tough part is like when I'm watching these Fox fights um this past weekend and they're not even commentating the fight and you got like a guy you you faced um omar juarez and they're not even talking about his fight they're talking about other stuff and i'm just thinking his family's watching it the other guy's family's watching it. you guys are giving us like some anecdotes about stuff and it's it's a little strange you know i man omar juarez is a cool dude good luck to him i'm glad he won that fight i ain't a hater on nobody Omar is a good guy, and he's a he's a good role model. Boxing has a lot of bad role models and all that. That was a crazy fight, man. That was a that was kind of like a um, like an old school. If that was on Friday night fights, that would have been like a a fight of the year. I feel like for some reason people didn't really watch it, 
but that was kind of like a like as Jr. used to say with WWF uh, a slobber knocker. <laughs> a slobber knocker. Hey, I I, I thought kind of for a minute I was like he about to might just wipe the floor with the guys because it started off, I mean just nasty, and then out of nowhere, dude just start making a comeback. I mean, that's it's that but see pace, that's what boxing though. is. It's that pace. I think he 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 was confident with the power. And I think that if you let some guys hang around, man, those veterans, that's something I had always heard. If you let a veteran hang around, they might just take you to that sixth round, that fifth round. And if you don't give them something to think about, they might catch you with a shot in the seventh round because they took you all the way to the seventh round just to try to do their move in the seventh because they already know they're up against the wall. So they're going to try to catch you with something to put you in that spot. Yep, two, they're going to go two for nil. And they already took your best shots in the earlier rounds. They, and they mind, what else can he throw at me that I can't take? So <laughs> they go take that chance, and they go take it. And they go, like you said, slobber knocker, well, they going to be throwing all those <laughs> with, no, with no hesitation. <laughs> what are the fights you're looking forward to, Will? Uh, like watching? Yeah, any fights out there? To be honest, I'm looking for Terrence Crawford and Errol Spence. I mean, I, yeah, but, like, we're never going to get this <laughs> fight, bro. Like, it's getting to the point where I just want my man Boots to fight one of them because Boots is down, bro. Boots is – send him a contract. He's fine. Like, he will fight these guys. You, oh, you know what? If that I, – I, I wouldn't mind seeing Boots fight either one of them, to be honest. That would be good. And and by the way, we're we're talking boots in as Mr. Catch a body. Yes, that sir. Okay, I'm just I'm clarifying. You know, yeah. Philly don't Philly don't shoot me. You know, Philly, <laughs> Philly in the building, but you know, shout out Philly, but don't shoot me. I, I I would like to see that happen. Or who else I can say? Uh, probably. Did you get work with boots? No, nah, no, nah, I I didn't get no work with boots. I got to see him work and get some advice from him. But hey, I'm I was still grateful. I was around a star, get to learn, see how another star work. Cause I picture myself as a star, so I know why I need to stay at and where I need to be at. So I mean it was good. I got some spar with one of his boys, so it was good work. I mean Was it Jones? Was it like Joshua Jones? Nah, I think he was gone. Um he was Puerto Rican. Oh, uh Jan Carlos Rivera. Yeah, I, okay. I like I, it was him I, I got to work with. I like working with him. Hopefully I can get some more work if I can ever get a chance to go back to Philly, man. When you out here and you ain't got no money, no car, man, like you can go anywhere. So <laughs> what's what's PA like? Like, what is that compared to coming from West Oakland and Vallejo? Like, that seems like that might be a difference. Man. Weather wise. We all know how to make it just be ugly any day away. So, I mean, weather-wise, it's cool, except for it could get way colder and then it snows. Like, I've been in the snow multiple times, but I I never really got to see the beginning of the snow. So, sometimes you, I mean, my Now you have to shovel probably to go places as opposed to like, hey, I'm at a snow place as opposed to now you have to do snow repairs. Oh, hell yeah. We got to, before we go anywhere, we got to let the car warm up. We got to scrape the snow off while i'm standing i gotta shovel the snow make sure keep the sidewalk clear i gotta throw salt and stuff down so it's like it, it's it's definitely something i gotta get used to and then it's like no disrespect to pa because i tell everybody i've met from pa this maybe i'm in the wrong place i don't know it is one weird ass place i mean my god coming from the bay it's just Cause I feel like we the creators of almost everything. That's just how I feel about us. They ain't never gonna give us our respect, but it's like, man, you know, every just... Bay Area person says that, and everyone from everywhere else goes. Everyone from the Bay says they came up with everything. <laughs> Cause, bro, you know, we got the swag, we got the lingo, we, you know, what I mean, we rap. We, it, it, I just feel like that's always us. And then you know, with this pushing P thing, like. I ain't, I guess I'm considered an OG now, but you know, P for us ain't the same P for them. It's like we've been using that way in the 90s. Like that, 
that's just up, you know what I mean? That's just up we on. It's like hearing music out here that I they be playing in the Bay Area. I be like, y'all know who that is? They like, yeah, man, you know who this is? They from the Bay. Like, of course I know who it is. But yeah, they're playing you like some Uncle Larry June or something, and they're they're trying to put you on game or something. Man, they playing Kato go off to them like, y'all know who this is? Oh yeah, man, like. Y'all don't really, like, this how we dance to this. And they like, nah. Like, I, the swag out here is killing me. It's, I mean, it's killing me hard. I've never seen so many Air Force Ones beat up a day in my life, Luke. It's, it's, oh, oh people wear oversized, I got videos. People wear oversized shoes. Like, and it's not just Phone dudes. posits? Are we getting phone posits out there? I don't even see phone posits. I, I, I just see. Air forces, air forces, air forces, air forces, air forces. And like I said, whatever size you wear, they'll wear those twice as big. Women too. And it's like, I know y'all know that's not y'all side, but you know what? It's PA. It's, it's, I don't know. I don't know. And then like, you know, it's a different of a culture shock out here too. Like it's, it's, I ain't gonna say it's a little bit, but it's definitely like, you know, a little bit segregated because come from we come from, yeah, we got racism over there, but you know, we fuck with everybody. Out here it's they don't really they don't really fuck with everybody like that. You know, well, I think that's important to talk about because like in the bay, if you're from the bay, like how do I say this? Like you know racism exists, but the Bay Area culture, unless you're on some Ku Klux Klan shit or something else, <laughs> you can't really move around the Bay and have friends if you don't deal with every type of people because the the Bay Area politics and dynamic, everyone's intermingled. And it's like people just mess with people because that's the Bay Area. People come together. But when you roam, that like I get what you're saying. Yeah, like I had to explain to a lot of people, like they saw my shirt, they're like, what the hell is that? And I was like, y'all don't know what Samoans are? They're like, nah. I was like, you know what Filipinos are? They're like, yeah. Like, but they don't really know. They just know black and white. And then if you Latin, they just know Mexican. Which, I mean, I ain't saying I fought them for that. It just, you know, it's just how it is out here. And it's like, you know, they they don't really say hi to too much people. Like, I, I was eating out one of the coaches and swear to God, a lady comes up to us and tell us, you got to be careful where you at. And I'm like, huh? And she like, I'm not like that, but you know, the place where you, uh, where you stand at, it's kind of dangerous for people that's like you out there. And I'm like, what the fuck? Like I shouldn't even, but it's cool. Like it, at Atlanta, when I was in Atlanta, they, they mingle around a little bit, but you know, they segregated too, but out here, it was like, it's just... Atlanta's different. Decatur, like, I went to Decatur. I didn't go to Mustafa's because I didn't know Mustafa at the time. But, like, it's like, there's Atlanta, and then they have that whole zone system. So, like, you don't even really understand. But, like, if you've heard a rapper say, you know it's messed up. So, if you've heard, if you've heard it in a rap song, you know you're going somewhere bad. But then it's like, there's all these, these suburbs, like Mechanicsville. And that's like, oh where are you going and it's like it's just weird how <clears throat> i feel like in georgia it's like these subsections so there's these smaller communities and people are isolated it's like middle class poor and it's like put into these subsections oh you you damn sure ain't lying like i was like i thought i stayed i was in a good part when i was in decatur i'm like oh it's cool not even an hour later dude got shot couple blocks away i'm like i'm finna go run at night i don't care anyway you know we're from the bay we we used to all the violence and then i end up walking to mustafa gym they tell me hey man you can't be walking around here like that. i go inside the store lady said you gotta put your backpack up what i said i ain't tripping and she like you must not be from around here huh i was like why you say that she was like one your accent two she was like it's just the way you know you carry yourself everybody out there was like you look like a fucking oakland nigga i was like how y'all know what oakland is it was like, no, we know what Oakland is. And, you know, we can just tell you just dress like that. I was like, well, I'm from the Bay. I'm from Oakland. They like, well, you can't walk around here like that, man. People be tripping. They trip off colors. They, out they, there. They, they're they tripping off the politics. They're bringing you into their politics and you're not even doing anything. They're like, hey, bro, you can't be yourself. You can't pull yeah, up here I, and be yourself. Yeah, I, I mean, I didn't care. I still walked around. Everybody out there got guns. Though. I ain't going to say they don't, but I was still around. I was still talking like me, and they was like, one dude, he my boy, 
he told me, I became real close with them up in Atlanta. They told me like, we thought you was a blood. And I was like, why'd you think I was a blood? I was like, <laughs> I was like, Oakland, we don't bang colors. And, and he told me, you say blood so much, I thought you was a blood. And I'm calling Crips bloods out there. I'm like, come on, blood, this, y'all tripping. And I said, nah, I say cuz too. But I say cuz when it's family. We were like, yo, what's up, cuz? Or somebody we consider family. That's what we do. And they was like, yeah, man, that was weird for us. Like, we didn't know if you was Crip or blood. I was like, you see, yeah, we don't we don't care about none of that in the Bay. If you bring that to the Bay Area, it, the Bay Area is different from anywhere y'all been to. And they, they only know L.A because of their colors and i told him well, i feel like sack's got a little bit of that politics but even sack isn't really tripping off of like i feel like even in this modern era it's not like 1980 bro people are tripping off of like what's happening they're not really tripping off the language because it's been so watered down in the music <laughs> exactly it's just certain places you go to it's just that just how they is like out out here i don't even know if i even been to the ghetto been past the ghetto been through the ghetto you don't I even mean, know bro you're like a space alien you're et man i i even tried to, to get on a bus and go somewhere out and caught over i i mean i don't even know if i done ran into a few people it's like to me i'm just me and everybody else all looks the same Every, like everybody looks the same in that that weird category unless it's the people i know that i became cool with and like it's a few people i know that i'm cool with they got some swag i'm like yo why your mans and people out here dress like that? Oh no, nah, see, they, they tell me I gotta go to different spots, but I mean, who knows, man? I said, we from the Bay, we know how to dress, we know how to talk. I mean, ain't all of us not pimps, but I will tell you, we all got a mouthpiece, we all got that in us. If we if we need to be able to talk, go maneuver through something that like the lingua I be talking out here, they be like, what? What are you talking about? So I gotta explain it. You gotta slow it down to pick it up. Exactly. I mean, they, everybody gonna catch on. I mean, like I said, well, Philly, Philly has some swag though. I know Phil, Philly's got some real ones. I was out in Philly and I saw a bunch of people with poo shiesty masks, and I was like, man, Philly needs to calm down with these poos. They need to out. I still think poo shiesty <laughs> masks need to be outlawed because they've made the streets too dangerous. Like you don't know who's out there for your health conscious and who's just really doing it. But in Philly, I saw two dudes on a corner with a poo shiesty mask and two girls. They were like on a date and they all have poo shiesty masks. And I said, this is I said, I know I'm in a situation. <laughs> I went the other way. I said, Yo, <laughs> I, I feel you. I ain't gonna lie. I was I, like I said, we 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 come from where grimy is at. But I, I was like, like I, we stayed in the, uh, the hood part of Philly. We was in West Philly. Then we went to South All Philly. of Philly's the hood, except for where there's monuments. And that's what I was about to say. Like the first, we went to a store, or whatever. We get in the store, right, Lukey? It's funny as fuck. I'm I'm waiting to see some Philly shit, hear some Philly shit. I'm intrigued with learning anything new. Dude, come in the store. We see a Philly cheesesteak. I'm like, oh, I'm trying to go there. Fuck it, let's walk. I ain't tripping us at night time. Let's go see what it is. Sure enough, dude pulls up. Who shites the uh? Ski mask on. He got he to shit off. Yeah, he take his shit off. Tattoos all everywhere. And you know, we know what certain tattoos mean. With it, you know what I mean? Dude, he, probably he was just he tall. was just explaining where he was from. Yeah, like you know, yeah, but he told he's like, oh, you a West Philly? You ain't from around here, huh? And we like, nah. He like, where y'all from? They like from PA. I said, hold up, nigga. They from PA. I I'm with them though. But I'm from Cali. Like, I, I came from the Bay Area. He's like, oh, yeah, that's cool. But you don't want to go there right now at nighttime. I'm like, what? He like, you got a strut? And I'm like, nah. He like, well, you might want to go there in the daytime. So I'm like, maybe niggas can be overhyping it. But I ain't going to chance it. Niggas start shooting as soon as we get to the crib. The next day we go to the fights. We go to North Philly. We chilling or whatever. I'm seeing everybody come in with these Philly cheesesteaks. I'm like, yo, I got to try one of these, man. I got to I gotta be put on. Where y'all get those at? They're like, man, you got to go down the block. So I've already been outside by myself anyway, looking at everybody, people walking by saying, what's up? I know I got this thing about me that people just like me, so I don't really be fearing a lot. So I, I, I'm like, man, I'm, can you point me in the direction? The owner of the gym where Dynamite them is at, tell me the same thing to do with the push he told me. He said, 
what you trying to get? I said, I'm trying to get a Philly cheesesteak. I'm starving. He like, you know where it's at? Like, you've you been around here before? I said, nah. If you go down there, you, you about to walk by yourself? I said, yeah. You got a gun? I said, yo, what's up? Where am I saying that? <laughs> I said, old oh boy just told me that last night in West Philly. He said, you ain't got a strap, man? I'm serious. Don't go. I'm like, come on, man. I said, I'm not from no suburbs. I'm not one of these, oh, I can get scared type of nigga. He said, nah. He said, I ain't saying none of that. He said, I'm just saying, man, this Philly is different than, than, than Pennsylvania. I said, I'm not from PA. I was like, yo, I'm from, I'm from the Bay Area. I'm from California. He like, oh. Well, still, you know, this this one of the murder capitals. Nigga, I'm from one of the top murder capitals, too. It, and he was like, yo, I ain't trying to argue with you. He said, look, ask my man. Two dudes come in. Hey, yo, you think you should walk down there right now? I swear to God, Lou, you go, you got a gun on you? What the fuck? I said, you know what? I ain't even go go, man. Everybody so is asking. Philly like Richmond at night? Is that what it is? man yeah it's like richmond and i ain't even gonna lie it's it's ugly no like i mean because like what it sounds like is it's like sound like 2003 west oakland when the street lights come on and if someone was walking two blocks it's like you're gonna go by yourself you don't got a couple of people are you gonna be watching for chevy vans like this that's what this is sounding like yeah man and, and no lie at nighttime it's like that like you the streets are so fucking narrow well you already know but the streets are so narrow Everybody moving around. I ain't gonna say who all had a strap, but this I know Philly is on a different level with this this violent shit. One (laughs) somebody I met, you know, might have had a blammy talking to me, whatever, yada yada, give me the advice. He know I ain't tripping off the gun, but in my opinion, I'm like, damn, why should that nigga have a gun? I mean, everybody should have a gun, I guess, but why should this nigga have a gun? You you're know saying, what I mean? Like, you're saying, like, he's not even he's not even in the politics. Well, I don't know if he's in the politics or not, but I know he's from the hood, though, in Philly, but, you know, what I'm saying is, like, just that somebody could get some success whatever they is or however they be, they... Yeah, like, just don't underestimate the people... Don't underestimate that people have to protect themselves if they're in certain situations because... But yeah but if he had to have a strap and go out after what i was like damn maybe i should or well, next time i come out here i should get a strap then i mean if it ain't safe for him he from out here and you know he high up maybe nigga, what they gonna look at me like well i mean so, i think philly's the ultimate tap in with somebody city like you gotta tap in with somebody because it's like I feel like that's just where it is. Like I feel like you do not want to go to Philly unless you go to the downtown district and see the the Liberty Bell and all that. If you go to Philly, you gotta know somebody, bro. Shit, I, I should. I guess I'm glad we knew somebody. But I mean, we even went to one of the Chinese food spots in Philly where a lot of shit was going on, and I'm like, don't tell me the waiter asked you if you had a gun. If he said, "Hey, man, are you are you going to the door?" and you go, "Yeah, man," he said, "You got a strap." <laughs> Nah, nah, nah. The, the boy, my boy I was with, he got out. He went to go get some Chinese food. So I was like, I get out the whip. He said, nah, I just stay in the whip. So I stay in the whip. But I, I always watch the mirrors. That's what I do. I'm always like this. I ain't in nothing, but the streets just taught me always just watch the surroundings. No, I, 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 I drive people crazy cars. because I'm, I'm, my eyes are always wandering at night because, like, I'm not even listening. I'm always – because I was actually at someone's house off seminary recently. And it's like every single car that went by, I'm scanning, I'm scanning, it's the car stopping, scanning, scanning, scanning. I'm like, oh, that car stopped. I want to take off. Like, I'm just See, always scoping. Well, I ain't going to lie. Seminary. I mean, that's where I'm originally from growing up there. Yeah, you might want to watch a lot of shit. I mean, I see a lot of shit at a young age with seminary. So <laughs> you, it's you just got a the place right where you got to scope. You got to scope. I'm not saying it's bad or it's good, but I'm just saying you got to you definitely don't want to just be there and be relaxed and and unobservant even if you go to the burrito truck on 55th you better be watching yourself <laughs> yeah any any point any point like any point there you know what i mean like especially by the hoagie shop we it, we should even be making like for us this is funny but who whoever watching kids or other adults we not saying we not saying this is a joke we we, we it just, really isn't this is a public service announcement 
for the families in Philly and seminary to be observant and to not take light of your surroundings because thing when hey i want to say this real quick when things escalate they escalate really fast so when when a situation happens it happens very quick and it escalates to a point that you could never imagine it happens and you have to be ready for that when it happens even if you're not so a good way to be aware of that is to constantly be aware of your surroundings checking your mirrors looking around see who's coming recognize faces all that stuff Man, no, no. If something get too quiet, in my opinion, when I was staying in San Francisco on Mature Hill, I used to be chilling. It's too quiet. That's good. Nah, that's not good. If it's too quiet in the hood for me, it's well. That's just trauma, bro. There. That's just you. That's just trauma. If if too quiet <laughs> is bad, because sometimes quiet is good. Give us, give us one final hood story before I get you out of here, Willie. Uh, one final hood story. All right. Um, <laughs> damn, it's not funny. So, <laughs> it's damn. It's a, it's a. This is a real good hood story because it's so traumatic and not funny. It's a laugher. So, shout out to everybody from Mature Hill because that's what everybody say I'm from. That's my second home. But we started as basketball league. All the hoods used to come through and 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 play at Patricia Hill Rec Center, and um, people was beefing with some people. This before the hill got separated, whatever. And um, you know, I it's just the hood. It's just the hood make people like this. And I'm playing basketball. I can't wait. It's it's a little league we got going on at nighttime. We got other hoods coming up, and before you know it, it's a shootout. In front of the gym, everybody shooting out dudes, couple dudes running to the gym, everybody running, screaming, scared. And I got the basketball. I'm still, you know, warming up. Dude come up to me. <laughs> he asked me, he like, yo, you ain't, you, you know, they shooting, they running in the gym. You ain't scared. First thing I told him, I said, nah. He said, what the hell? Why you ain't scared? You still young. If it's meant for me to die, I'm going to die. I live in the hood. You got to dodge bullets some way, somehow. If we, if we still for the player, what? They, they shut, they shut the gym down. Whatever. They didn't want people to walk home. Me, I'm a hard ass. I'm a hard head. I didn't give a fuck. Plus, I lived up there. I damn near grew up the second half of my life up there. I knew damn near everybody. So I'm like, I'm gonna just walk home anyway. I end up walking home or whatever. Shit end up going down. Dice game get robbed. Then I really thought I was going to die. They laid me down. People getting chased by cars. First thing I thought, I ain't going to say what set was up there, but I was like, damn. I was cool with the set that, that was driving through. And I'm like, they finna mistake me as a hill nigga. They finna shoot me. It's over right here and there. And it all happened because I wanted to go shoot some fucking dice. I was good at gambling. But that's the story. <laughs> well, that it's- reminds me, like, you remind me of a... I. I- a long time ago, I was doing something where I was in Funk Town. I think it was a video. And the video had just wrapped. And it was kind of weird because there were different neighborhoods. Like, so a guy had gotten killed, R.I.P. Jacob from Funk Town, Jake F.T. And the video was at this school in Funk Town. And then there were three different hoods. But then, have you ever heard of a guy named Street Black? I'll always remember this. Oh, so yeah. Street Black parked his car in the middle of the street. So now no one can drive down the street, but there's multiple different groups of people. So there's this group, Chris group, but the, no one's talking, right? So we leave and all types of stuff. Everyone's gone. Street black's gone, everything. And I'm the last one to leave, right? So everyone was like, kind of like, wait, everyone leaves. And then I had filmed. So they were kind of like, let Lukey, a couple people stayed with me because they were just like, we want to make sure the, the video people paid me. So unrelated and i want this to be for law enforcement if they hear this is unrelated to the video (laughs) no it really was unrelated it was i get throw my camera and this is the camera bag um that i think i took you to your spot in sf when we went to the amateur fight in selena same camera bag throw it in my trunk i hear pop 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 jump in my car i think i got like 300 dollars for the video shoot it just falls out of my pocket I drive four blocks down because I heard, well, actually I told the story wrong. I heard someone running. 
So I heard the feet. So I thought someone was running up on me. Then I heard the shots. I couldn't tell if the guy that was running was shooting or if someone was shooting at him. I got in my car and then I called my friend the next day and they're like, yeah, someone got shot over there. And I'm like, yeah, I was, <laughs> I was in the vicinity <laughs> was right after that. And I just remember like, I was like, when you said like, if it goes down, it goes down because like, I didn't know how that situation was going to play out because I can't emphasize to the listeners enough how loud those feet were. Like, it didn't sound like someone like a few blocks away. It sounded like someone really right close. behind you. Yeah. Like it was those loud stomping things. And then I heard the shots and I like, you got to remember my back is turned. I'm throwing my gear in the trunk. I didn't even shut my trunk. I just jumped in the car, drove three blocks down. I didn't even look back. I'm just like, I got to drive down the street a few blocks, got out, looked, no one's there, shut it. And then I went on my way. Cause your life on the line. I mean, people don't, people don't really understand. And that's a funny story, even though it's not a funny story. <laughs> I can picture that too. You just, <laughs> no, like I literally, I literally heard the shot. So like we were there, keep in mind, but like, you know how, like when it's a memorial for anyone, right? Everyone's yeah. tension is high because it's hella depressing. And then when it's like a violent shooting, it brings out a different energy too, where some people are sad, some people are angry. And we were kind of doing this thing that was like, I wouldn't say it was like a funeral, but it was like a closure type thing. And a lot of people would come together, but it was a lot of people that maybe didn't want to come together. And then like, I'm on edge and I'm like, good, nothing happened. And then right as I let my guard down, I heard that. And then I was like, but I don't think, but this crazy thing is I don't even think it was anything related to that. I think it was just something that was happening and it ran parallel, but thank God the video shoot had ended because imagine if that ran parallel to like 70 people. Damn. You might've been in jail right now, Lukey. I don't think I would have. I don't think I would have because I'm, I wasn't doing anything criminal, but it would have been, I think the bigger thing for me would have been like, I don't want to get caught up in something. And that's a big thing with me now with boxing. Like I find it so annoying when boxers try to make things like street situations because you're boxing. This is an avenue to be productive and have a career. I don't want any street situations with anybody because I've seen what street situations lead to. It lead to massive incarceration and it leads to broken families. It leads to um, children getting raised in, in ways that are not healthy in which the, there is no cycle of healing. And I think that one thing as I get older, I get frustrated when people or people's role models are pr promoting stupidity to young people or glorifying things that they've never done in an effort to um, look cool. I mean, you know, our generation is, is different from a lot of people now. I mean, some people probably is still doing that. That's probably our age with the boxing stuff. It's like people just want to put people in a in a box with other people just so they can be like, nah, fuck him. He was on his side or whatever. It's like it's a business. And then it's it's we fighting at the end of the day. I mean, we all boxers. I like I don't hate, I don't hate nobody. Some people feel like I probably do got hate towards other boxers. I don't hate nobody. I wish everybody luck. Maybe, do I want to hear about them? Hell no. But I'm not finna be like, you know what, Luke? Yeah, I don't want to no interviews with you. I don't want to fuck with you well, no more. Like, if I didn't someone. like someone, I'm just not going to rock with them. I'm not going to be like, I think the most unsaucy thing you can do is talk down on someone. Like if you're like, oh, I don't like this guy. I'm going to call up my buddy and tell him don't don't do it. Like if you don't rock with there's always going to like the OG Kareem Mayfield once said to me. There's always going to be people that don't like you and you can do everything right. And they're just going to decide they don't like you. But like to add to that, what you have to take from that is you have to just remove them from your life. If someone doesn't like you, you just can't be around them. Like that's the solution. Yeah. You got to let them go. I mean, I feel like you're on the right track. Like you don't there let nothing phase you. Nah, well, I can't. You know, I can't, I'm super, because this is what doesn't phase me is there's a whole region where if something happens to me, like our, the Willie Shaw's and all that, you don't get those cool videos and people don't get to see your stories. And when you win your first 
belt and stuff. People don't, people can go back to this channel and see the amateurs video. What was that? Your third or fourth fight? Oh we've man. Been, we've been <laughs> rocking since then. And I shot the thing. I think I might've even been, I snuck into the fight. Um, <laughs> I might've even been in your corner. I don't even remember how it shook out. I know I stretched you out for the fight, but I mean, yep. this is the type of stuff that I'm giving people through this channel and people that's why I, i'm big on the rips because it's like i want to pay tribute to those before you know and it's like this is not just a boxing channel this is not fight hype this is not boxing scene this is a community that's um helping grow people you know check in and tap in that's what what we're doing over here before i get you out willie talk about your small heritage oh man uh my Samoan side, they from uh, San Francisco, California. Taylor's American Samoa. And, uh, we was a fighting family, too. The, I, those the ones I was raised with also when I moved from, from Oakland. It's like it's, we can't kind of stand each other most of the time. That's just how it is. But in the Bay Area, if you Samoan or just poly, everybody knows everybody. Every poly somehow to be related to anybody. So if you see me around a lot of other polys or you see me at a function with some other polys, if we ain't related, we might have somehow be related or we didn't grew up with each other. We damn near call each other family. I mean, that just that just how it is. And then we rock strong. I, mean, I got family in Seattle and stuff. So that just oh, and in LA. How hard how much harder do you think you hit because you're Samoan? Because I feel like you, there's never been a Samoan boxer that didn't hit hard that people oh, heard. Oh, of. oh, okay. I'm about to say, uh, but I don't know. I mean, it could be that because of that blood it could be from my dad's side, the black side. Because, because David Tua, legendary puncher, you know, left wasn't, hook man. Yeah. Wasn't he Samoan? Yep. He was Samoan. Yeah, just got into the Hall of Fame. You know what it is crazy though? I so what it could be that because I don't know where the hell my power come from. I mean, I, I'm stronger than probably what I even think I am, and it's ridiculous. But everybody in my family damn near strong. I mean, it, in the poly culture, to be honest, the women is really stronger than most dudes. Like that's who really run shit. So if you run into a poly dude, a small dude, Tony, do whatever, and you think he he that tough. Get him around his mom or his sisters and see who beating the fuck out of who. Guarantee the sister is pounding on them. Oh, it's, I mean, my, my sisters terrified us kind of growing up. I mean, you didn't, especially when they got drunk. So, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> so, so I mean, I mean you, you've been around my, my, my siblings. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. You see how they are. They probably just tap you. It's like, come on, yo, I'm, I'm right here. Uh, why you hit me so hard? Like you're gonna go back to Philly. Someone's gonna say when your sister's around, "Hey, you got your strap." <laughs> <laughs> I, I I got them. That's all I need right there. They gonna block every bullet from my ass. <laughs> hey, where do people follow you, Willie? Man, you can follow me on the ground at boxing underscore b o i and a number five boxing boy five man. Oh, okay. shout out this... to Lukey TV for always putting me on. It's like what when i make it they know if when i make it and i'm a champion like how george Campos said this little speech i felt that i just want everybody to know this guy who's interviewing me he's gonna be right there if he ain't in the ring just know lukey go be right there beside at all the championship fights when i get a chance to be able to bring who i want to bring lukey's gonna be that guy there and it's not because Lukey's a fucking blogger. It ain't because Lukey liked me as a friend. It's because Lukey is a real person. He showed genuine love. And he believed in me when probably a lot of people didn't believe in me. So that's a lot of love for that. And I respect you for that, Lukey. Well, I respect you too. And I also, for, I've been forgetting to get you on these things because I knew you've been going through things. So every now and then, we're just going to do a check-in with Willie, man. We'll do some fight recaps or anything, but I want I want you to be more ingrained in my universe so the fight fans that listen to my show, they stay up to tune with my man, Willie Shaw. Yes, sir, man. Good looking out, Lukey, man. Yeet.